This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Welcome to Aquarium Mania on Pet Life Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Roy Anong, speaking to you from the University of Florida's Tropical Aquaculture Laboratory in Ruskin, Florida. Thanks for joining us. What do Major League Baseball and Coral Reef Aquaria have in common? If you said the Florida Marlins new ballpark in Miami, you're right. The new Marlins ballpark, scheduled to open in 2012, features two state-of-the-art coral reef aquaria, both within wild pitch distance of home plate. Our guest today is Francis Yupanko, the very experienced Director of Business Development and Marketing and Senior Marine Biologist for Living Color Enterprises, Incorporated. Living Color Enterprises designed and is building these elaborate and high-tech aquarium systems. Join us as we discuss how Francis and his company's team are making baseball, hot dogs, and tropical fish a unique and entertaining combination. We'll be right back, right after these messages. Stay tuned. Molly, here's your dinner. (coughs) Zeus, that's not your food. Don't let that happen to your precious cat. Elevate your cat's eating experience with the Cat Tree Tray. The Cat Tree Tray keeps your cat's food off the floor and conveniently located on the cat tree. It's the perfect way to eat. It's a beautiful wrought iron tray that easily attaches to your cat tree and keeps dogs and other critters out of your cat's dish. A must for multi-pet households. There's a 6-inch tray for large bowls and a 4-inch tray for smaller bowls. Purchase your Cat Tree Tray today. Go right now to CatTreeTray.com. That's CatTreeTray.com. C-A-T-T-R-E-E-T-R-A-Y.com. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to Aquarium Mania on Pet Life Radio. My guest today is Francis Yupanko, Director of Business Development and Marketing and Senior Biologist for Living Color Enterprises Incorporated. Thanks again for being with us today, Francis. My pleasure. Well, this is a really pretty neat set of aquaria that your, your company is building over in New Marlins Ballpark. I've got a lot of questions about that, but I kind of wanted to talk with you a little bit first about your own background and, and how you got interested in this whole uh, industry. How old were you when you first became interested in aquarium fish? I was, uh, I was 10 years old, so I've been in the industry, or sorry, in, as a hobbyist for a, a very, very long time. And what was your very first fish and or tank, if you can remember that far back? Uh, I do. It was uh, actually a five-gallon goldfish tank. I had one, uh, a goldfish at uh, the fair, you know, throwing one of those balls into a uh, a cup, and uh-huh. uh, I needed a place to put the goldfish, so I went and got a goldfish tank, and a year later, I had my first uh, marine aquarium and discus. That's a pretty big jump. <laughs> you must have uh, really mastered the goldfish. Where did you grow up? I actually grew up in Vancouver, Canada. And then I think you mentioned that you actually started working at an aquarium store pretty soon after. Can you tell us a little bit about that that experience? Sure. I worked at Big Al's Aquarium Store in Vancouver. Big Al's is, I guess, pretty well known here in, in the U.S. now because of their big online presence. Ironically, I would, uh, you know, 18 years later, I'm working for for Living Color, whose sister company operated Big Al's USA with their big uh, store here in, in Tamarack, Florida, which was actually the largest aquarium retail store in the U.S. Big Al's USA has since changed its name to All Fish Emporium, which is still owned by Living Color's um, parent company. And we're opening up a second store called All Pets Emporium in uh, Miami later on in the new year. So uh, everything connects. Everything goes full circle, as they say. So uh, did you have any any big lessons or did you learn anything uh, that you're still taking home with you when you were working there at, at Big Al's? I definitely did. I mean, Big Al's was by far the largest and best aquarium store we had in, in the city. And um, what I was exposed to a, a large diversity of, of fish and invertebrates at the, at the store. I was an avid reader, so I would take home books from the shop every week and uh, pretty much learned and read everything there was to learn. I really became passionate about keeping live corals in the early 90s when um, the hobby was still pretty new. So 
that was something that I really took away from there and benefited me in the long run. That's definitely really great advice for anybody, uh, whether they're a hobbyist or a professional, to really learn as much as you can about the, uh, the animals you're going to be working with. So how then did you get all the way from Big Al's to all the other jobs you had before your present position as the uh, Director of Business Development and Marketing at Living Color? I know you, you worked for both private and public sector, large-scale projects, etc. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, it's uh, kind of an amazing story. I, I didn't know it at the time, but uh, there was a, a customer who had come into uh, Big Al's almost every week and, and quizzed me about corals and, and keeping corals and various uh, reef fishes. And one day he asked me um, if I'd like to work for him. And I asked him, who are you? And he told me that uh, he was a curator at the Vancouver Aquarium, which is you know, Canada's national aquarium and at the time was the third largest aquarium in North America. So um, that was a, an amazing opportunity and uh, learned so much from uh, working at that public aquarium. And they actually also helped me uh, finish school with a big scholarship. So that was definitely something that uh, I'm thankful for. And then you moved on. So how, what was the next step or what, what made you decide to go elsewhere after uh, Vancouver? Well, after I finished my degree, I kind of uh, wanted to move up the I guess, seniority or structure of, of, of the aquarium industry. And doing that without relocating to a new facility is, is very difficult. So if you want to move up quickly in the ranks, it's best to move to uh, where new aquariums are being built. And in the Middle East, during the um, five plus years that I was, was over there, I was involved in the construction and uh, commissioning of four large new public aquariums. So then you moved back to the States. How, how did that occur? How did you go from, from Dubai, which must have been a pretty exciting place and, and kind of time and experience for you to come back home to uh, the U.S.? Well, the, the company that I was working for uh, in the Middle East is called Isham International, and they're a, a large aquarium um, construction and management company. They operate four out of the um, six public aquariums in the Middle East at the moment. And Living Color would sell quite a lot of product to um, Isham in terms of artificial corals and, and some aquariums. So then I approached Living Color with forming a, um, a joint venture partnership to help you know, solidify both of our, our company's positions. And we formed a joint venture company called Living Color Dubai. And after that was um, all set up and running well, I wanted to move back home closer to uh, my family in North America and um, moved to Fort Lauderdale where Living Color is based. So you must have a, a lot of uh, business acumen to uh, do all that, or did you have any kind of business background as well? well I did minor in, in uh, business administration uh, in addition to my uh, marine biology degree, and I'm also finishing up my uh, MBA at the moment as well. Okay, that's great. Yeah, that's definitely a lot of a lot of stuff to learn both on the biology side as well as the business aspect for uh, this pretty amazing industry. So uh, now I have to ask, are you a Marlins fan? I am a Marlins fan now that I live here in uh, South Florida, but at heart I'm a Toronto Blue Jays fan. In the uh, mid-90s when they won their several road series, I was hooked. So you don't feel like a traitor then? I can uh, like both teams, just like I, I like the Panthers and, and my hometown Vancouver Canucks as well. <laughs> okay, okay. I just, just wanted to clarify that so no one you know, kind of gets mad at you. So, <laughs> so uh, I guess you've obviously have been involved with a lot of uh, the goings-on with the new park. When and where approximately is the park going to be? And, and uh, I guess what is the estimated date of completion for the park? Well, the, the new ballpark is actually on the site of the former Miami Orange Bowl um, Stadium, which is two miles west of downtown Miami. And it will be ready for the 2012 opening day for uh, the Major League Baseball season. So how did your company first get involved with the ballpark? What kind of was involved with the concept or even the consideration for having aquariums in that park? Well, the president of the Marlins is actually... Uh, an aquarium enthusiast. He has a large uh, live coral tank in his home. And when you know the architects were researching uh, about putting an aquarium into, into the park, they weren't sure what location it would be in, whether it would be at the entrance or some other location. They um, researched you know, aquarium companies and what uh, better company to do it than the, the largest um, aquarium manufacturer in the U.S., who's also a local Florida company. So it only made sense, and um, we had some uh, discussions with them. They came and toured our factory and saw some many of our other projects, and uh, decided to uh, to go forward with the with the uh, 
two new aquariums. Francis, can you describe how these aquaria in the, the new ballpark are going to look, I guess, in general on the you know, inside and the outside? And we'll talk a little more specifically about some of the systems things, but just kind of for the person that's looking at them for the first time and to give our, our listeners an idea, what do they look like and where are they going to be put in the park? Well, there's going to be uh, an aquarium on either side of home plate, and they're actually going to have to be quite quite thin because there is a um, a railing which separates you know the stands from the field. So these are going to follow the curve of these of the railings and uh, be set inside of these um, these railings behind home plate. The decor inside of the aquariums will replicate a uh, South Florida and Caribbean coral reef, we're going to use our um, museum quality artificial corals, which are actually molded from urethane, uh, molded out of urethane and cast from real coral skeletons. So the corals that you see inside the tank will be um, what you would find if you went um, snorkeling or scuba diving here in South Florida. And what kind of fish are you guys looking at or what type of fish are you going to be putting in these systems? The, uh, the marlins want to keep it as uh, Florida as possible. So we're going to, um, to take advantage of the aquaculture industry that's uh, really prevalent around the state and procure fish that are um, aquacultured for the ornamental uh, aquarium industry and have those in the, in the aquariums as well as a lot of other um, South Florida and Caribbean uh, reef fishes. Well, I want to continue to talk with you about these incredible tanks at the New Orleans Ballpark, but let's take a short break and we'll continue our discussion of baseball and coral reefs with Francis Yupenko of Living Colors Enterprises right after these messages from our sponsors. It's designerpetsweaters.com, hand-knitted designer sweaters for your precious pup or cool cat. Beautiful couture patterns for your pets, including custom-knitted formal wear, casual wear, yachting, and even sports-themed. Many designer pet sweaters include feathered tammy hats, top hats, and a lot of sparkle. Each sweater includes leg loops, front paw sleeves, and leash opening. Visit designerpetsweaters.com to order your four-legged fashions today. Your pets will stay warm for the winter and be runway ready. Large or small, we fit them all. Designerpetsweaters.com Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. We're back and continuing our conversation with my guest, Francis Yupenko of Living Color Enterprises. So a little more, I guess, about the specifics of these aquarias since they're going to be kind of logistically more complicated than your basic home or office aquarium. Some basic questions first. What kind of salt are you guys going to be using for this system? We will actually be using our house brand of salt, which is a Living Color branded salt. It's a salt that we use in, in all 200 of the um, local maintenance accounts that we have in South Florida. And every time we, we build a turnkey uh, marine aquarium, we supply the client with uh, this, this salt. It's available at All Fish Emporium in, in Florida, but also available online. And it's a, a great salt for um, all fish-only systems. Now, Good water quality, of course, is in- incredibly important, and you know this probably better than, than anyone, uh, re- you know, regardless of the tank size. What different types of filtration are you guys going to be putting into these systems to help maintain that water quality? Well, this, uh, these commercial aquariums are, are quite a bit uh, more complex than, than your standard home aquarium. Uh, for instance, the filtration room for this aquarium will be uh, located 100 feet away on a floor below where the actual aquarium's will be loaded. So there's a very, very long um, pipe run between where the plant room is and where the actual exhibits are. But um, a lot of the components are, are similar to what you would have in a home aquarium. For example, we are going to use ultraviolet sterilizers. We're going to use uh, large protein skimmers. We're going to use um, a series of um, canister filters for mechanical filtration, possibly a sand filter, to keep the aquarium cool and to um, heat it, we're going to use a um, titanium heat exchanger, which has been very, very effective in, in other large systems that we've done in the past. In all, there will be about 30 pieces of uh, life support system equipment for the tank, and the pumps that we'll be using will have a series of redundant pumps uh, to make sure that there are no problems, and we'll tie it into an emergency generator as well. 
So it sounds like quite a major undertaking. Have any of these types of configurations been any that you've used before for any other types of exhibits that you guys have put together? The basic principle of, of the life support system for this aquarium is very similar to other large commercial aquariums that we've built. We build dozens of, of large aquariums. You know, the smallest aquarium that Living Color builds is about a 200-gallon tank and just gets up bigger from there. You know, 35,000 gallons is not uh, in excess of, of an aquarium that we would typically build. So it's definitely something that our life support system design team here has done in the past and has able, been able to refine and um, make, uh, I guess, run like a, a fine Swiss watch. Now, you mentioned, I guess, getting as much aquacultured fish as possible. Have you um, contacted any companies locally or, or um, have you guys kind of got that already sort of in, in, um, in the works? We have not uh, contacted any local um, aquaculture companies um, as of yet. I mean, the uh, opening date is still almost a year and a half away, but we will definitely be speaking to various companies uh, over the coming months. Now, I, I know, you know, being a kind of a fish health type person, some of the headaches sometimes come from, uh, you know, quarantine sort of issues, that sort of thing. Are, are you guys going to be, you know, doing any type of quarantine or, or what's kind of your normal sort of routine when you guys are setting up some of these big type exhibits? Definitely very, very um, important to quarantine all fish that go into our aquariums. We do for every aquarium that we maintain two to three week quarantine and perform a prophylactic treatment on all fish that uh, go into our aquariums. Another question, just being involved in the industry and kind of having a feel for how much work goes into trying to keep these things, you know, really clean. What are sort of the mechanisms or ways that you guys are looking at for, you know, keeping things like algae and, and you know, other sorts of things from uh, making the tank look a little less than you'd want it to? We actually have a, quite a, a unique solution to um, keep our, our tanks clean. Over the years, we have developed a cleaning product, which we call Aquamade, and it's actually an industrial strength cleaning solution made out of concentrated um, hydrogen peroxide, and its high oxidizing capacity eases algae removal from our artificial corals and reefs and significantly reduces algae growth on the aquarium decorations. The Aquamade product is actually being used by many, many dozen professional aquarium maintenance companies across North America and has been a huge hit with our product line. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I was wondering about that because I, I guess maybe you could talk a little bit about the back to the aquariums again. These are going to be relatively tight-fitted in terms of the their covers, I guess. Is that correct? How are those guys made? We're going to actually build a secure airtight lid, which is going to go on top of these tanks. And the reason for that is just to to prevent um, any pesticides or, or things like that going into the tank and airborne when they're spraying the, um, the field. Um, and we've actually been able to really fine-tune how we build these um, airtight lids because Living Color is actually um, the manufacturer of choice for um, yacht aquariums. We build quite a bunch of aquariums on, on yachts, and because of their sloshing around in the waves, we've had to build um, watertight lids and um, engineer them. So we're going to apply what we've learned on our yacht projects on this aquarium. Wow. So um, going back to, I guess, since you mentioned the pesticides, so in the rooms where I guess the air would be coming in, do you guys have you know pretty decent air filters, that sort of thing then to kind of help with the air that's going into the, the systems? It's definitely something that we've um, incorporated in the life support system design and we'll make sure that there's no, no threat from that uh, in the um, areas where we're going to have all the filtration. Now, the big uh, hit question, no pun intended, of course, is uh, how to keep baseballs from uh, wreaking havoc on your aquariums. Now, what's, what was your um, solution for that? Well, the aquariums themselves are going to be um, built, the structures, out of uh, heavy-duty um, fiberglass. And then we're going to have crystal clear acrylic panels uh, about one and a half inches thick as the viewing windows. And they'll run the whole length of the aquarium. But to safeguard the animals from unexpected impacts from baseballs and, and things like that, we're going to be using um, Lexan, which is the material used in uh, bulletproof windows. And we're going to install that shield all along the aquarium and leave a gap so that if there's any vibration, if a uh, ball strikes the Lexan, it won't be transmitted onto the um, aquarium itself. And um, 
you know, lexans used on um, the uh, cockpits of airplanes, and you know, they th they throw chickens at them at several hundred miles per hour without any problems. So, I think a baseball should should be more than uh, uh, no match for these lexan panels. <laughs> that sounds true, definitely. Now, since these are airtight lids, can you explain how the fish are going to get fed? We actually. Um, have a system because we do build um, you know, a lot of um, large commercial aquariums that are, you know, some. We actually just finished one recently that is 30 feet tall. Uh, it was a 30 foot tall cylinder, and feeding uh, a tank that's uh, that high or that difficult to reach, we actually um, developed a um, a unique feeding system, which is a, a pressurized canister. We call it our um, uh, convenience feeder. It's a pressurized canister which is located in the aquarium filtration room. You fill this canister with um, frozen foods, or in this case, it'll be um, a pellet called New Era. You fill this canister with, with the food and push a button, and a dedicated pump will pump that into the um, supply lines that feed the tank, and the nozzles will be located throughout the tank, and food will come out of those, uh, those nozzles, and that's how you feed the fish. Wow. So are those going to be kind of set to feed a couple times a day or how, how do you guys have it? The feeders are, are um, have to be, be loaded manually so when our, our maintenance team is there they can feed them but um, we also have a, an automatic uh, feeding system that we can use on the tank as well and, and we'll have to you know sit down with the biologist who's in charge of maintaining the aquarium and figure out what the best feeding regime will be. So that was another question of mine. So you are in addition to designing and constructing, you, you guys are also going to be maintaining them as well. We maintain initially all the uh, aquariums that we build in South Florida. We offer a, a maintenance service so that the client can um, get the tank up and running and, and the fish can be stabilized. You know, we, we cycle the tank and, and add the, the animals and then um, our maintenance division takes over from there. So during the Non-game days, uh, what, what is kind of the plan for the aquariums when you know, no one is normally around? How are you guys going to have the, uh, the tanks set up, I guess? Well, we're going to have a, like a shroud or a blanket cover the, the tanks when it's uh, non-game time. And the reason for that is so that we can keep the diurnal light cycle that the, uh, the fish will like and, and they won't be you know, shined upon with the big um, field floodlights uh, during the evening time. And we'll just have to adjust the, the lighting for games as required. But um, whenever there's uh, nothing going on, we'll, um, the aquarium's covered up. I'm assuming you, you do have a way to get in in case you need to like remove or move things out the way uh, you have it currently situated. Um, you can obviously remove parts of the lids or, or get into them if you need to. Correct. I think that um, you know, removing uh, algae and having to, to skim off the tritus and things like that, we'll have to design the uh, top of the aquarium's uh, along the fence uh, to be, you know, user friendly for for the maintenance technicians to um, to access. But uh, as far as the design of those goes, that that hasn't been finalized quite yet. So, were there any other kind of unique challenges that you had to deal with with these particular aquaria, or did they kind of fall into some other challenges you have had previously in some of your other uh, aquarium setups? Uh, well, this aquarium is unique in the fact that it's in a, a very very public location. It's going to be built uh, a lot more, uh, you know, robustly than uh, the normal, especially with the the Lexan shield. But um, as far as the technology and the design and and the the systems and the decor that is going into the aquariums, that's something that Living Color does uh, on a daily basis as as the largest um, custom aquarium manufacturer. You know, we face unique challenges with every custom aquarium that we build. If it's uh, in a ballpark, if it's on a yacht, or if it's on, you know. Uh, 50 floors up on a, on a penthouse. It, uh, each aquarium has its own unique challenges. So have you started working on these tanks already or are uh, you guys kind of waiting for the mm -hmm. ballpark to maybe have a little bit more um, construction? Well, there has, been some, there has been some concrete uh, poured already in the plant room because they are, are pouring uh, a lot of the slabs. So you know there is some civil work going on. But as far as um, actual aquarium fabrication and stuff like that, that has not begun yet, but we have, you know, finished a lot of the detailed design for the tanks and uh, working towards construction drawings as well. So I'm assuming since you've been involved both on the public aquarium side as well as the retail and, and you know, the really kind of industrial side of it, that you see uh, potential for education. Uh, are you guys 
kind of looking at education for sort of a non-traditional crowd at all? Or how, what are your thoughts on that for uh, coral reefs and baseball? Well, we definitely um, uh, want to, to highlight, along with the Marlins, the fact that you know, Florida's uh, coral reefs are threatened and that we should support the aquaculture industry. And I think that's why we've um, selected the, the types of fish that are going to be placed in there and also gone with uh, fabricated synthetic um, corals and reefs. So did you have any f- final thoughts at all? Any uh, kind of closing thoughts on uh, as, as you've kind of traversed the, the globe and gone from uh, Vancouver to Dubai and you know, in some of the work you're doing now in the Marlins Park, any final thoughts for our listeners? Well, I think that uh, this aquarium is, is going to be a, a world's first. I mean, it's uh, a unique uh, location, a unique um, setup. I mean, where else are you going to be able to watch a baseball game and look through two giant aquariums? That's going to be um, quite amazing. But, um, you know, we're ready for the next challenge for another exciting commercial or residential project. And um, this one will be a great marquee for the Marlins organization and for the stadium and for Living Colors as well. I agree, and I, I think it'll definitely be great for uh, the aquaculture industry. I, I'm, you know, real closely involved with a lot of the uh, aquarium fish producers in the state, so I think that'll be a really good educational tool and marketing for them as well. So uh, definitely uh, appreciate your spending some time with us. Unfortunately, we're out of time now. I'd like to thank you, Francis, and our producers, especially Mark Winter, for making this show possible, and uh, appreciate all the work your uh, company has been doing and, um, and it sounds like some pretty exciting and really neat uh, aquaria in very interesting locations uh, including uh, yachts. Please be sure to check out Francis's web pages on Aquarium Mania as well as the uh, Aquarium Mania blog on Pet Life Radio. Also, if you have any questions, comments, or ideas for a show, email me at drroy at petliferadio.com. If you're over in Florida, please be sure to visit the Aquarium Mania exhibit at the Florida Aquarium in Tampa, one of my favorite aquariums. And definitely be sure to take in a game and enjoy the beautiful coral reef exhibits at the New Marlins Ballpark in 2012. Until next time, please visit your local aquarium stores and keep your tanks clean and your fish healthy. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.